It is a pleasure to be with you again. I was here last year at this same briefing and had a good time, so I thought I'd come back. The, um, and I, I want to commend you for having Diet Coke as my pref uh, preferred, preferred caffeine of choice this morning. So not enough of it, I, as I can tell, I'm already stumbling. But, uh, uh, God bless you all for coming. Thank you for caring about our country enough to be here today. And uh, I'm going to follow up on what you just heard. And I'll, I'll say one thing, that even though he read his speech, he was much more interesting than Jonathan Edwards. Uh, because Jonathan Edwards, and I was there, I was a, I was a kid. But I, was, but I was there, and he intentionally tried to be boring. Uh, and so you, your delivery was much better than Jonathan Edwards. Uh, I'm not, the subject matter may be uh, different, uh, um, but hell is a common theme of what you, you talked about. The Supreme Court and centers in the hand of an angry God, about the same thing. Um, and his analysis is spot on. I mean, he's a layman from a, from a legal perspective. I practiced constitutional law, argued in the Supreme Court constitutional issues, won a 9 to 0 decision on school choice, the, the prior speaker, um, was, was the issue that I uh, argued in, in the U.S. Supreme Court. And I tell you, everything he said was exactly correct, exactly correct, well done, meticulous, accurate, and good analysis of, of both the problem and the solution. The um, effective place we find ourselves in this country is that we have two constitutions. We have the Constitution as written, and we have the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. And they rarely coincide. Once in a while they do, uh, usually by a five to four vote in the wrong direction. Uh, but sometimes a five to four vote in the right direction. The two most recent decisions on the Second Amendment, for example, have been five to four decisions in the correct direction. But they're five to four decisions, a single move of a justice on the Supreme Court, and, and our Second Amendment rights are in jeopardy. The uh, free exercise of religion, the reason we needed a Religious Freedom Restoration Act was because the Supreme Court got it wrong on the free exercise of religion in a case called Employment Division versus Smith back in 1990. And so the uh, reason that I hel helped to lead that, in fact, I'm the guy who named the law. Now, it sounds really elegant, but. We were in a committee meeting, and they said, what are we going to name this thing? I said, well, why don't we call it the Religious Freedom Restoration Act? They go, that sounds good, next item. So that was the entire vetting of the, of the process. That's pretty much more word for word what happened that day, and why I'm the guy who named it. But these kind of solutions, Religious Freedom Restoration Act was reversing a decision of the Supreme Court of the United States. Once in a while, you can do that with legislation, but it's rare. The vast majority of the time, especially on the, on the uh, question of the substantive power of government, you cannot reverse the Supreme Court except through a constitutional amendment. The idea that we can impeach Supreme Court justices is a theoretical possibility, but there are real barriers to it. First of all, the impeachment powers for high crimes and misdemeanors, and there's an argument to be made that disobeying the original meaning of the Constitution would qualify as a high crime, a high political crime, and there's some history to back that up, but it's highly debated. Beyond that, you're gonna have to repeal the sin nature of mankind and political reality in Washington, D.C. to make that a, a reality because you need two-thirds of both houses of Congress to be able to, well, actually, two-thirds of the Senate to convict uh, a Supreme Court justice, you need a majority of the House of Representatives to charge the justice with a crime, and he goes on trial in, in the U.S. Senate. You're never going to get those kind of votes in the United States Senate because sin nature controls, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and there's one rule in Washington, D.C., and that rule is this. Whatever increases the power of Washington, D.C., we're for it. All three branches of government follow that same rule. Whatever increases the power of Washington, D.C., whether it's in spending power, whether it's in taxing power, whether it's judicial power, whether it's the power for the president to make law, despite the fact that Article I, Section 1 of the Constitution says all laws are made by the Congress of the United States. Everything, the common thread for, through all those things is a steady increase of the power of Washington, D.C., over the power of the states and over the power of the people. 
Let's just take the example that was alluded to earlier, the president's power to legislate with a phone and a pen, which I've pondered that to some considerable degree. I get the pen. The pen is writing executive orders. Is he tweeting executive orders with his phone? I, or is he getting calls from his handlers telling him what laws he's supposed I don't know what the phone's about. It's an interesting uh, thing that someday maybe we'll know the answer to that. But whatever he's using his phone and his pen for, Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution says all legislative authority is vested in the Congress of the United States. You all are familiar with the Hobby Lobby case. The Hobby Lobby case was decided under the law that I wrote, helped to write, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And they won, not under the Constitution because of the Supreme Court. But why did we have an abortion rule in the first place? It's not in Obamacare. There's no abortion mandate in Obamacare. It was a regulation from the Department of Health and Human Services. The Secretary of Health and Human Services, 2,000 times approximately in Obamacare legislation, it says, the Secretary shall make rules that. Well, when Congress does that sort of thing, they, they think that they're giving away some of their legislative authority to the executive agencies. Not true. They are giving away the right of the people to elect the people who make the laws. You cannot give away the rights of another person. Congress cannot give away, not lawfully anyway, give away the rights of the people to vote the rascals out. We can't vote out the Secretary of the Health and Human Services who made the abortion mandate. And the congressman said, well, we didn't vote for that. Well, they didn't in a direct sense, and they get plausible deniability because instead of having an abortion mandate, which would have been a political death knell for a lot of them, they instead said, the Secretary should make rules that. The only way to fix this problem is take away the power of Congress to delegate the rulemaking authority to take away the power of the executive branch to make rules. The rules should be, if the executive branch wants to propose rules, fine, let them propose them. They go to Congress, and Congress has to vote and put their political capital on the line and vote for or against the abortion mandate, for or against the rules that are destroying farming, for or against the rules that are destroying the coal industry, for or against all these crazy rules that you see on a regular basis. If we do that, We'll have fewer laws and we'll have fewer regulations on our lives because Congress, A, won't have the time to vote for all this stuff, and B, won't have the political willingness to, to put their reputations on the line for the crazy kinds of things that are going on. Moreover, the power of, the, of Congress to tax and spend is going to absolutely kill this country. The real debt, as I hope you all know, is not $19 trillion or whatever the rate. And I saw a bumper sticker recently in the D.C. area that said, please don't tell Obama what comes after trillion. Um, and, and so the, 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 the number, when you take a, the real debt, which includes all the entitlements that are vested but not yet payable today, like I'm 64 and I'm eligible to collect Social Security, I paid in probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've been fully employed since I was 14 years old, so 50 years now. I, I paid a lot of money into the system. All the money that I paid in has been borrowed out. None of that money is carried on the national debt. They have sp separate phony accounting for that. If they took all of the accounting that they have to account for, then the real national debt is north of $140 trillion. It may be as much as $200 trillion if we take the real debt. And all of that is going to come to roost and is going to crush this country. And so the one thing that we can do that does the solution to all of these problems that we've talked about, the judicial overreach that was so well laid out beforehand, the spending overreach, the executive power overreach, all of the areas where the federal government is exceeding its constitutional authority, the only solution that is in the text of the Constitution is the Convention of States process in Article 5. The process works like this. Three stages. One state, one vote at every stage. Stage one, when two-thirds of the states agree on the subject matter, then Congress is obliged, it's a mandatory duty, to call a Convention of the States. There have been over 400 applications for a Convention of the States, including several from Iowa, over the years. We've never had a convention because we've never had 
two-thirds of the states agree on the subject matter. So you have to have two-thirds of the states to agree on what you're going to do. The subject matter that we are proposing that passed the Iowa House this last year didn't get through the Senate. We're working on getting it through the Senate this coming year, but it, it's, it, it is uh, proposed for these purposes to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, which means more than a balanced budget amendment. It means spending limitations as well and proper definitions of what an indebtedness is. And so uh, a balanced budget amendment is a good idea, but it's uh, it could be a dangerous idea unless accompanied by spending limitations, which is why we say fiscal restraints. Secondly, uh, to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Judicial reform, regulatory reform, uh, fixing the general welfare clause, fixing the commerce clause, all of those things fit under that topic. And finally, impose term limits on federal officials, uh, which would, you know, as I travel around the country and have spoken to several hundred legislators about this already, the um, maybe more than a thousand by now, um, the my 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 prediction is term limits on Congress, maybe maybe not getting to 38 term limits on judges, 48 states will ratify that, because there is no limitation currently on federal judicial power where you can at least theoretically vote the rascals out in Congress, and so it is far more accepted and far more uh, popular to talk about term limits on judges. And so, but both of those things are germane at the convention. But when you go to the convention, one state, one vote, the state legislature appoints the delegates, they give them their instructions, they're obliged to obey their instructions. At the original constitutional convention, every state was instruct, their delegates were instructed on a quorum rule, for example, that some states appointed seven delegates, some appointed five and so on, and they said what the minimum number of delegates voting and participating had to be in order to cast a vote for Virginia or New Hampshire and so on. And the convention meticulously followed the, the delegate rules set up by the states. The convention didn't control that, but every state controlled it and, and the, the, they give the instructions to their states. So at the convention, it's one state, one vote. Anything that relates to the topic of imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government, limiting the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, or term limits on federal officials. Those things can be lawfully discussed, and an amendment can be written, and can be voted on. Anything that's on anything else, taking away Second Amendment rights, taking away First Amendment rights, any of those things cannot be discussed, and cannot be voted on, and cannot be considered. It would be illegal to do so. I filed a lawsuit and succeeded in winning as a, a team member, I, I filed it initially by myself. But I got joined up with a team uh, when they tried to manipulate the rules on the Equal Rights Amendment back in the late 70s. I was six years old, but I was a lawyer. Um, and uh, I was actually two years out of law school. And when I filed this lawsuit, challenging Congress for manipulating and changing the process in the middle of this dream. And we won. And the ruling of the federal court at the time was you can't change the rules in the middle of the stream. And so there, there, are, there are checks on this. And so the only lawful topics that can be con considered are the topics that I've outlined for you. Then you go to stage three, and that's um, the stage of ratification. 38 states have to ratify. So if, if, if uh, something non germanes not gonna come out, but if the, a bad version of a balanced budget amendment could come out, let's just take that as an example. Like they say, you have to balance the budget unless it's windy. Uh, or you have to balance the budget unless we really don't want to, okay? Those would be va bad versions of a balanced budget amendment. Well, what would it take to defeat that? You have to have 38 states to vote yes, so what does it take to vote no? If a single house in 13 different states votes no, the answer is no. And so the chances of anything bad getting through that system is exactly the same chances of President Obama appointing me to the next vacancy on the Supreme Court of the United States. It's theoretically, you can see a path where bribery and LSD use might get him there. But there's no rational basis for concluding that Obama is going to do that. And there's no rational basis for concluding that we can't find 13 states to defeat something that's crazy or bad or ill-advised. And so the only possibility is we'll do something great or we won't do anything at all. 
Those are, the, those are the real options that are before us. And the situation our country is in, we don't have a choice. We're really a lot like a person who's been diagnosed with cancer. What's going on in Washington, D.C. is eating away our freedom. And we've got medicine that's in the Constitution of the United States. This isn't some extra constitutional idea that somebody dreamed up and they've got some footnote from some guy in 1836 or something that they're, they're working on. No, this is in the actual text of the Constitution. It's straightforward. Why was it given to us? George Mason said it in the, on the floor of the Constitutional Convention toward the last week or so of the convention in September of 1787. He said, the government we're creating someday is going to abuse its authority. And when that day comes, we cannot expect Congress to propose amendments that will limit its own power. And he didn't say it out loud, but what everybody in the room believed was this would require us to repeal Adam's sin nature to believe otherwise. They all held a Christian worldview, not on every single subject, but every single thing, but they all viewed the sinfulness of man as inherent. And the reasons we have checks and balances and federalism in our government is because of an absolute abiding conviction about the sin nature of man. That's the reason. There's no other reason than that. It's core to, to what this country was, in, uh, was written upon, why our government was framed the way it was, is because of that Christian worldview about the nature of man. Mason said, we can't get amendments that will limit the power of the federal government from Congress. It is never going to happen. And they all responded, using Bart Simpson's favorite phrase, like, duh. Now, they may have said, we hold that truth to be self-evident, but whatever it was, the way they expressed it, it was the same idea, and it passed unanimously in, in the notes in Madison's notes, it's nemcon, without dissent. And so the, the founders understood and adopted this framework of the, of the Convention of the States to give the states the ultimate political power in our country. The Supreme Court of the, uh, uh, decisions say correctly that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. But the supreme political power of the land is not the Supreme Court's. The supreme political power of the land is to lawfully, they're amending the Constitution unlawfully, the su supreme political power is to lawfully amend the Constitution of the United States all by yourself. Only the state legislatures can do that. Two thirds, three, the, 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 the numbers, um, the official analogy here is a junior high locker combination. If you, your mind goes someplace else, it's your problem. It's 34, 26, 38. 34 states propose the amendment, 26 states write the text, 38 states ratify the text, and when we have that, we can take back the abuse of power that's going on in this country. We can stop Washington, D.C. once and for all. Just holding the convention will scare Washington, D.C. to death for at least 50 years. And, and if, if that's all we do, we've done something very great in this country. Grassroots are the key. The victory in politics always goes to a majority of those who participate. This is state legislative lobbying. Presidential politics are a lot harder. But by the way, no matter who is elected for president, and I'm you know, hoping for the most conservative president possible, whoever will get elected. Even, my, even if you elected you know, somebody who's my clone as president of the United States, it's not going to fix it because Washington, D.C. is structurally messed up. This, the solution's not going to come from Washington, D.C. It's going to come this way. It's the only thing that can save the freedom of this country. And so we have to make a decision. Are we willing to use the medicine that's in the Constitution, or are we going to just sit and die of cancer? Those are, those are the realistic options that are before us. I am not one to sit on the sidelines and to say, well, let's just let it happen to us. I believe... Yeah. So, I hope and believe that some of you will have questions at this point, and I'll get to say other things I want to say in answer to your questions. So, who would like to ask me? Yes, sir. Uh, and, and the answer is yes, I wish I would have gotten the creme brulee rather than the blackberry sorbet. So, uh, in, in, inside joke. Okay. Um, All right. So, it seems to me the current presidential. Uh, 
campaign is bringing widespread recognition that there's major problems in this country and in D.C. Unfortunately, the focus, as you pointed out at the end, is hopeful that a presidential election will solve it. And I agree with your assertion. This is much broader and much deeper than what one person can solve at the present. But, but the question that it seems to me is how do we take the energy that's being created around that presidential recognition, uh, recognition of the presidential campaign that things are broken, and how do we transition it to this true solution uh, rather than just hopeful that one person can make these changes? Have you, have you given thought to that? Well, I have. Um, and I haven't come up with it. Coming here today was one of the reasons. I mean, it's Iowa. It's, it's the reason I'm here. Uh, is because I, I hoped that injecting this thoroughly into Iowa presidential politics, and there, you know, I'm not here to endorse any candidate or anything like that. I'll just, but I will tell you that two candidates have endorsed us. Um, Mike Huckabee and Bobby Jindal are the only two candidates who have formally endorsed the Convention of the States, and so I, that's factual information. And you're entitled to know it. Um, there's nobody that's repudiated it. There's just Others have, you know, not taken a formal position. So, um, or among the Republicans, I, I have no idea about the Democrats. Uh, um, but the um, being a good nonpartisan or nonprofit person, I have to say that. Um, but you know, I, I'm hoping that people will see that the this is the strangest presidential race ever, by a long shot. It's just, you know, anything that any rational person would have thought of would have happened is just not happening. And I'm convinced that the reason that unorthodox people are being given serious consideration is because of they're so frustrated with Washington, D.C. being broken. They're willing to take anything that looks like they're tearing down Washington, D.C., even if that won't result in that, even if they don't have a clue with what they're talking about. Uh, people are voting out of, or at least tending to poll voting uh, out of that frustration. I hope that people will recognize that we need to have real solutions that really work and actually have a possibility of, wor of working. And people need to ask questions to make sure that people can deliver on the promises they're making. Because candidates, can, it's easy to promise anything. It's, it's hard to deliver. And if they, they need to have a plausible means of getting there. But ask them the questions. Go to the town halls. Ask them. Get it on television. You know, get in one of the debates. I, I, you know, I can use your help in that. But you guys are Iowa. I'm not, and uh, um, I need your help on that. That score. We probably have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Well, make it a really long one. <laughs> All right. It seems to me, in watching uh, the television and the media, that there is a certain uh, percentage of people that watch a Republican debate, et cetera, that understand the consolidation of power at the federal level is a bad thing. However, there's a huge percentage of the American public that for some reason thinks the consolidation of power at the federal level is a good thing. That will have to be overcome on a popular basis because people don't think linearly anymore. They think emotionally. Um, I, I certainly agree with the last part of it. Um, I, I would say on the consolidation of power issue, people just want outcomes. They, I, I don't think that they really care whether it's from the federal government or the states. They want this service, they want that service, they want this freebie, they want that freebie, and they don't care if they give up their freedom to get it. Um, and, and so the, the most important question you can ask any presidential candidate or any candidate for any office is this question. What's the purpose of government? And if they say something like, the purpose of government is to provide needs uh, for the people, then they're a socialist. If they say the purpose of government is to protect life, liberty, and pro property, and punish those who do evil, then they believe in the basic principles of freedom. And those are the two divisions, and then you have people in between those, those two things. And so uh, people who want goodies, who think the purpose of government is to provide for their needs, they're mixed up. But if you ask them just a straight up question, we've done this. And it polls very well. Where do you want most of your decisions made for pol political issues? Do you want them made in your locality, your community? 
in your state capital or in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. comes in third place every place. In Berkeley, California, we actually did this. In Berkeley, California, Berkeley came in first, Sacramento came in second, and Washington, D.C. came in third. My partner, Mark Meckler, is the one that asked the question. I wasn't there, but, but so people understand the idea of thinking local. The reason that, you know, the local food movement is growing. People like local, and so getting state and local decision making, it should be a nonpartisan, bipartisan kind of approach because people want to have more control over their own lives because the principle that we're, we're fighting against, which is the principle that was identified in the judicial reform speech, is this. Who has the authority to make decisions for us? And when there are federal mandates on the state legislature in Iowa, what it is is the voters in California, Massachusetts, and Illinois are telling the legislature in Iowa what to do. That violates the principle of American self-government. If we're going to take back self-government, this is the only approach. People like self-government. and we, gotta, we explain things, we educate the people. There's a chance they believe this, and there's a chance we, we can have victory. Since this is my last question, I'm told, please go to our Convention of States booth. Sarah, our state director back there, uh, young homeschool graduate, it will be glad to sign you up to get you involved. You can also go to our website, conventionofstates.com, and sign up online. We'll give you email uh, reminders when votes are coming and keep you informed on the issue. But uh, those are the ways you, you can get involved, and I really would appreciate your help. So, And we... Uh